today by answering a question that I think many of you uh, have in their mind is how is possible that uh, a little Italian economist like me ended up spending most of her career analyzing uh, the funding of terrorist organization tracking their money so I think this uh, uh, the answer to this question is very much related to who I am, but also why I'm here today. So the story is that um, uh, one of my childhood friends, uh, she became a leader of the Red Brigades. You all remember the Red Brigades was the Marxist armed organization, which was very active in Italy from uh, the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, now, of course, I did not know that. I discovered it one day, the day after she was arrested, uh, she was on the front page of every single newspaper. And it was a shock to me. It was a shock for many reasons. But in particular, it was a shock because at that time, um, I was 24 years old and so was she. We, um, my generation, spoke about the arms struggle on a daily basis. Um, it was... <laughs> the most important topic of conversation at political level. And she had never, ever expressed uh, any interest uh, or any positive comment about the armed struggle. So I, I stayed in touch with her. Uh, of course, we never spoke about why did she become a terrorist? Uh, because she was an unrepentant, so the Red Brigades, if you remember, uh, as part of their strategy to fight the Italian state, they never spoke with anybody, including their lawyers, uh, during the trials. Um, in 1992, 
they declare the end of the armed struggle. And at that point, they issue a list of names of people with whom they would talk, with whom they would tell their story. And I was one of those people. Now, that came to me as, that was the second shock, I say, of my, of my life. Um, at that time, I was working in the city of London as an economist. Uh, I just had the baby, and the last thing I wanted to do was actually to go back to Italy and start interviewing former members of armed organization. So it was a difficult decision, very, very difficult, but I took that decision because I realized that during the 15 years in which we have been corresponding with each other, I had this question burning in the back of my mind. It was, what turned my childhood friend into a terrorist? And why she didn't try to recruit me? So, I, I, <laughs> They, the Red Brigades, as all the other armed organizations, they used to recruit among family and best friends, and she was my best friend. So that's why I changed my job, <laughs> went back home, and I spent three years talking to former members of armed organizations in high security prisons, and I got my answer. She became a terrorist because she believed that there was no other way to unblock the political situation in Italy. Italy had been run for 35 years by the same party, the Christian Democratic Party, which was, of course, backed by the United States because it was um, an important country in the divide, uh, in the European divide of the Cold War. So she thought the only way to change the situation, the only way to give the opportunity to the Italians to really express themselves politically was through political violence. The reason why she did not recruit me is because uh, I failed the psychological profile of the Red Brigade. I was, <laughs> I was too single-minded, too opinionated, and they thought I would have been trouble. And they were absolutely right. <laughs> but while I was uh, doing these uh, interviews, um, one day, I remember I was having lunch. Oh, by the way, in those prisons, there are brigades and all the other armed organizations. They became great chefs. They cooked these amazing meals. So you go there, sit down, have an interview, in, and you felt like you were in a, a five-star um, restaurant, something like that. So I was having lunch with Mario Moretti, who was the, the guy who kidnapped and killed Aldo Moro. It was the leader of the Red Brigades at that time in 1978. So while I was talking to him, he was telling me how they were funding their activity. And he was extremely proud of how they were managing to raise money. While he had been extremely reluctant to talk to me about ideology. And at that moment, I had the feeling I was back in the city of London, in one of the dining room of you know, a big bank, having lunch with a banker. And suddenly I realized that there was something more to terrorism than ideology. And that was actually finance. Because what these people did all day long was not discuss ideology. The ideology was set in stone by the leadership. It was never discussed. But what they did was discuss strategies to raise money because they were always, always short of money. Now, terrorism is actually a very expensive business. So um, this, this discovery was very important because until then, so we're talking about the mid-1990s, um, we all believed that terrorism was uh, funded uh, primarily through state sponsor of terrorism. Now, that was the feature, of course, uh, of the Cold War. So we had the United States bankrolling uh, different groups uh, and the Soviet Union, other groups that would fight each other along the sphere of influence uh, of the Cold War. Now, 
th- it was not like that. Um, because what I discovered is that the state sponsor of terrorism is something the armed organization used uh, initially to establish themselves. But then uh, what they really seek is uh, self-sufficiency. Because nobody wants to fight war by proxy. Everybody wants to fight their own wars. So that was a fundamental discovery that changed completely my analysis of what terrorism was um, and what, of course, terrorism will continue to be. Now, I told you this because um, you can see that my life is deeply intertwined with those years, the 1970s, you know, what... mm, um, had been defined the gli anni di piombo, the years of the bullet, um, and uh, I could be one of the character of the film you will see you know, after my lecture. Um, and if I had been different, if I had a different personality, a different character, somebody would have tried to recruit me. Somebody would have tried to turn me into a terrorist. So this is important because. Um, Number one, I do not look at members of armed organizations as psychopaths uh, or crazy people. I actually look at them as individuals uh, who have embraced the armed struggle, who have embraced political violence uh, through a rational process, uh, through a rational decision, even if, even if this decision came through indoctrination. The other thing is that War by proxy do not exist. It's just another word for what terrorism is. In ultimate analysis, anybody that agrees to fight a war for somebody else does it in order to fund its own war. And that's a lesson that I think our politicians, unfortunately, do not want to understand. So let's, uh, on the basis of what I've told you, Let's talk about the Islamic State. This is the topic of my lecture today. And what I'll try to explain to you is how it's possible that an armed organization, because the Islamic State is an armed organization, exactly as the rebel brigades were, has become a state and an ideology in the space of a very, very short time. So, in order to explain you that, um, I would like to start from the present, uh, and then, you know, we backtrack to the origins of the Islamic State. So, the first question to address is really, what is happening in Iraq and Syria? Do we know? Do we have any idea? Because the propaganda is coming from everywhere. It's not only the Islamic State, that of course, is using propaganda. It's also our own politicians, our own media. So the reports so far are that the Iraqi army in Iraq has been advancing. They have conquered Ramadi in the winter, which is in, um, a town um, about 30 kilometers from Baghdad. And now they are at the gates of Fallujah. We all remember Fallujah, very important uh, um, Sunni city, uh, about 80 kilometers from uh, Baghdad. So one could say, well, this is a very good news. The Islamic State has been defeated, at least you know, in this area. But then when you go and analyze the details of these victories, the picture changes completely. So, for, for, for example, who, who is fighting inside the Iraqi army, one would think, the Iraqis. Well, actually, this sort of army, if you want to call it army, is composed by various groups. So there are Iranian troops, there are a crossover from Iran, there are Shia militia, there are Kurdish militias, and everybody is fighting on the ground with the help, of course, of coalition forces, which are us, uh, who are bombing the position of the Islamic State. Um, So, the Iraqi army does not exist. Each of these groups is participating in a proxy war to fight against the Islamic State. Each of these groups has its own agenda. So, let's look at the agenda. The Kurds 
are fighting against Islamic State because they want to establish their own enclave. They want to create their own state. So Fallujah, for example, and Mosul are contested cities. Although you know, the majority of the population are Sunni, there is a very, very strong Kurdish presence. The Shia, they want to retake these cities because they, they want to establish their own position within the Sunni triangle. In other words, you know, they want to crush completely the Sunnis, which is more or less what they've been doing since you know, they got to power in Iraq. Um, a similar scenario, so, well, you know what the Iranian troops are doing, of course, you know, they're backing the regime of Baghdad, which is a Shia regime. Uh, a similar scenario we find in, uh, in Syria. So in Syria, for example, at the moment, uh, we have two groups moving quickly towards Raqqa, which is considered to be the capital of the so-called caliphate, the Islamic State. From the north, uh, we have the Kurdish troops backed by the United States moving towards Raqqa. From the south, we have the troops from Assad regime backed by the Russian. Whoever gets first, I guess, you know, will take the city. Now, what do you think is going to happen to the Sunni population, which is in Raqqa? they will, of course, become refugees. Now, that is another interesting aspect of these victories, which could easily turn into Pyrrhic victories. The Islamic State, before abandoning any city, at least we have seen until today, destroys completely these cities. It reduces the cities to a pile of rubble. There is nothing to do there. The people cannot go back to their homes because the homes have been completely destroyed. But more important, there are no money to rebuild these cities. The Iraqi government uh, is broke. There, um, it has very, very large debt, uh, which is also related to the fact that oil prices have been falling for quite a long time. But also, yes, to repay heavy expenditure that have been spent by the coalition forces to protect the Iraqi government. So there are no money to rebuild these towns, which means that the population is forced to become refugees. Most of these refugees, uh, um, they do not leave because they can't. Uh, They're too poor to come to Europe. So they become refugees inside. Iraq or inside Syria. Now, this is the best possible breeding ground for the future generation of jihadists and suicide bombers. This is why I'm saying we got to analyze the details of the news that we get on a daily basis. The other thing um, is while, of course, um, the coalition forces are bombing uh, um, the area which is near Baghdad in order to reconquer part of the Sunni Triangle, the Islamic State is advancing somewhere else. So we have, uh, we have seen a series of terrorist attacks taking place inside Damascus. We have also seen the Islamic State regaining some territory near Aleppo. And then, of course, we have the presence of the Islamic State's uh, all over the Middle East, Libya, the Sinai, um, even in Lebanon, there have been few cases, and of course, Turkey. So the boundaries of the caliphate are constantly shifting. They are constantly changing. It's almost like the sand of the desert. So those news that we may interpret as very good news in reality, they may not be good news. Uh, they may hide something else. So um, the other question to ask uh, about the present uh, before we analyze how we got where we are is wh what are the consequences of this prolonged uh, 
proxy war against the Islamic State for us. Because, let's face it, this is a long-term war. This is not something that will be over in the short run. So, I mean, the first um, consequences, of course, is that the bombing campaign has produced a massive, massive influx into Europe of refugees. The Russian bombing campaign, which was much more brutal than the Western coalition campaign, has produced about 11 million people who are on the move at the moment, trying to reach Europe. And most of them actually come, not necessarily from the region where the caliphate has established itself, but they come from the region where the various groups, the rebel groups as they are called, but you know they're all armed organization, are, were fighting against the Assad regime. So we're talking about the northwest of Syria, near the region of Aleppo. So, um, of course, Europe can't deal with this. We've seen it last summer. Uh, we also have seen that some countries are taking um, difficult decisions. For example, Denmark, uh, who decided to confiscate uh, uh, all the valuables of refugees um, trying to um, enter um, their own country. Um, and then we have the Brexit. We have the referendum in the United Kingdom. I live in London, and I can tell you that the most important topic... Uh, or discussion of the referendum is immigration, is the influx of refugees into Europe, who of course you know will then you know move towards you know the north and in particular you know to the United Kingdom. So potentially this phenomenon could break up the European Union. I mean, think about if the United Kingdom decides on the 23rd of June to leave the EU, what are the consequences for, you know, for this continent? Absolutely disastrous. So um, there are been tentative to solve this problem in a very quick way. I would say in haste. Um, we've seen that Angela Merkel has broken several deals with Erdogan in Turkey in order to keep the refugees in Turkey. Um, we don't know exactly how this deal is going to take shape, but so far we know that uh, um, the offer from Europe was uh, about 4 billion euros um, in order to build um, refugee camps inside Turkey, but also the allowing um, Turkish citizens, we're talking about 77 million people, to enter Europe without a visa. Now, uh, I'm not here to discuss uh, uh, immigration, but this is a decision, there's a typical decision that's been taken by the Europeans in the last... Uh, 15 years or so since 9-11, which are decisions taken in haste without uh, thinking about the consequences uh, in the middle and long term. So we will have 77 million uh, Turks who can enter Europe without any visa. But above that, we will have people coming from a country whose borders are with Syria and Iraq. And these borders, we know, are porous. So is this um, making us more secure or this making us less secure? This is what the Europeans are debating at the moment. Another consequence, which I think is even more serious, is the... Um, the nationalist, uh, the return of nationalist terrorism inside Turkey. Now, we've seen uh, um, in the last two years uh, uh, various groups, uh, PKK or offspring of the PKK or Kurdish groups, uh, who have started again to use political violence in order to carve their own independent state. And this political violence, of course, is directed against the regime of Erdogan, which has become, during the same time, more and more Islamics and more and more oppressive.
So we see a polarization of politics in Turkey, which is an important, absolutely important country for Europe because it sits at our border and is the bridge between Europe and Asia and the Middle East. Now, all of this is the consequence, a direct consequence of what is happening in Syria. So um, in the course of this lecture, you'll see that I'll talk more about this sort of knee-jerk reactions of the Europeans to events that require a completely different strategy. But um, for the time being, let's look at the last point. It is the security of Europe. Now, we have seen um, a string of terrorist attacks taking place in Europe. And you may think that these attacks are all the same, but in reality, they're not. Um, we have moved from one model to another model. The first model was um, the sort of lone wolf individual who would carry out an attack uh, to emulate uh, what the Islamic State is doing in Syria or Iraq. Uh, the call to arms of the caliph uh, right from the beginning has always been you come and join us here. We need you here to fight um, um, our war in order to build this new nation. But in the, the most recent attacks in Brussels, we've seen something different. You were not talking anymore about um, isolated individuals, maybe two, maybe three maximum. Here we're talking about a network. And this network is taking shape in Europe. What does it mean? It means that in reality, um, the call to arms is not anymore a call to arms to fight in the Middle East. It has become a call to arms to fight in the European cities. The network is very similar. It's taking shape. So we cannot... I'm sure the network is already there, but we don't know exactly how it's shaped. But it's taking shape exactly in the same way as the old 1970s networks. There is no difference between the network of the Red Brigades and this network. The difference is that, of course, there are no borders anymore. So we do not have anymore a national network. We have a transnational network. Think about the attacks in Paris, uh, how you know, the, the logistics took place between Brussels and Paris. Brussels and Paris are the capital of two different countries, but there is no border anymore. So we're facing uh, something like you know, the Schengel terrorism, uh, which we have never seen before. So um, why Europe? Why all of a sudden... Uh, these people want to carry on attacks in Europe. Well, the answer is very simple. Killing a, a couple of Europeans in a European capital becomes international news. Its effect in terms of propaganda is massive. If you kill 50 Iraqis, it doesn't even become a news. Look, yesterday, in Turkey, in Istanbul, 11 people died because of a terrorist attack. It was no major news. It wasn't at all. Now, if the same attack had been conducted in Vienna, it would have been plastered all over the world. Now, that is what is happening. And that is a danger for us that we do not want to consider, but it's there. I mean, Europe is the best place. It's the easiest place also, because they can't reach the US, but they for sure can reach Europe. So that is the danger. So <clears throat> just to summarize, uh, I think we are moving uh, uh, away from the model that we have uh, uh, faced until today. Uh, towards uh, a new major, major change in the threat of the Islamic State and of jihadism in general. Um, and this is number one, uh, more attacks in Europe. This is the idea. Um, 
the proxy war in Iraq and Syria as providing enough funds and weapons uh, to other groups, for example, the Kurdish groups, uh, in order to start carrying on their own attacks uh, in order to achieve what they really want. Then we have, of course, the situation of um, the Shia in Iraq who do not want a multi-ethnic society, but they do want to get rid of the Sunni, and they want to turn Iraq into a 100% you know, Shia supremacy. Then we have, of course, you know, the situation in Syria, which is very similar, because you know, the Assad regime, this is what he wants to do. With the help of the Russian, they are trying to reconquer the entire country, and of course they'll be ruled exactly in the same way. So you know, the Shia will oppress the Sunni, and the Sunni in these two countries, which of course they perceive the Islamic State as the only political force that can protect them. So this is not a good situation. And I would say that this is much worse than it was two years ago when we started bombing. So let's now address the final question. How did we get <laughs> to this point? How on heart did we create such a mess? And the answer starts from 9-11. The response of 9-11 was the war on terror. The war on terror was a way to remove from Iraq Saddam Hussein, who was a dictator we didn't like anymore. But of course, we couldn't do it so easily. So the idea was that he had weapons of mass destruction and these weapons of mass destruction would be used against Europe. You remember the 45 minutes of um, a Tony Blair that in 45 minutes uh, Saddam Hussein can launch, can launch a nuclear ballistic missiles against Europe. Well, there were no proofs of that. The inspector went in, nothing was found. So in the end, they had to find, I'm talking about Tony Blair and George Bush because these are the two individuals who masterminding the all war on terror. They had to find another reason to go and that reason <coughs> was a link between Saddam Hussein and <coughs> um, bin Laden. Now, of course, this was unreal. Any expert on terrorism um, was shocked when this news came out. Uh, Saddam Hussein was not <laughs> an ally of bin Laden. On the contrary, they were enemies. But the Link became uh, an obscure individual called Abu Musad al-Zarqawi. He was a Jordanian, he was a radical Salafist, and he had run uh, a small camp in Herat, uh, which is you know, east of Afghanistan, near the Iranian border. And in this camp, he had forged suicide bombers uh, to be operating, to uh, be activated in Jordan. Now, this individual was a radical Salafist, and that was enough for you to understand that, of course, you could not be a member of Al-Qaeda. There's a major difference between radical Salafism. The Islamic State is a radical Salafist, of course, and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had this idea that <clears throat> we had to fight, they had to fight against the faraway enemy. Only by destroying America then the various jihadist organizations could have got rid of the existing corrupted oligarchic regimes of their own country. So that's why they did the attack against the Twin Tower, the 9-11. Now, radical Salafism was absolutely against that. It was not interested in the faraway enemy, it was interested in the near enemy. So the idea of radical Salafists was we have to fight within the borders of our own countries and our goal is to create the caliphate. That is our goal, to get rid of these people, so these corrupted oligarchic regimes and reproduce the splendor of the caliphate, of the seventh century's caliphate. So that was enough to, to understand that Al-Zarqawi could not have been Bin Laden man 
in Iraq. But it was sufficient for the word that the Secretary of State of the United States, Colin Powell, told in February 2003 to the Security Council that al-Zarqawi was the super terrorist, that he was the bin Laden men in Iraq, then bin, La then bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were planning a terrorist um, nuclear attack against the West for the world to believe that al-Zarqawi was really the super terrorist. And it was not only the West world, it was also the rest of the world. So all the sponsor, all the people that sponsor Al-Qaeda until then, all of a sudden started to shift their funds to Al-Zarqawi. Because of course Osama bin Laden was in a cave hiding in Tora Bora. The Al-Qaeda had been destroyed in Afghanistan and all of a sudden we have this new leadership. So Al-Zarqawi all of a sudden <laughs> did become the super terrorist. I mean, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the first attack was in, um, um, in August 2003, and it was two simultaneous attacks, one against uh, the United Nations headquarters, and the other one was against uh, a Shia mosque inside Baghdad. Now, that was the beginning of the sectarian warfare. Until that moment, in August 2003, the Sunni and the Shia had fought together against coalition forces. And that was a strategic decision of al-Zarqawi. He realized that the only way for the jihadists uh, to take the leadership in the insurgency against coalition forces was to split the Sunni and the Shia. Otherwise, uh, they would have formed the Sunni and the Shia a sort of secular front, uh, and the jihadists would not have had any opportunity. So that is the beginning of the feud between the Sunni and the Shia. It has nothing to do with religion. I mean, the religion goes back many, many centuries ago. It was a strategic decision of a radical Salafist uh, taken on the ground. Now, um, all the leadership of the Islamic State fought with al-Zarqawi. But what is important to understand is that when the Americans uh, arrived in Baghdad, they dismissed um, the army and the police, uh, so, and the intelligence, of course. That was the so-called debatification process. So all the top-ranking people, all you know, the important uh, people of that regime, uh, ended up uh, being unemployed. So they decided to join the insurgency. And because al-Zarqawi had all this money, they joined the al-Zarqawi group. So by August 2003, that group already had two components. One component was the religious, the jihadist, so the radical Salafist. But the other component were you know, the former members of the Badas party. Now, this sort of um, marriage of ideology was particularly consolidated from 2005 to 2010 in a prison camp called Camp Bukha uh, inside Iraq, which was run by the Americans. And this is where al-Baghdadi, which is now the caliph, uh, ended up together with the leadership of the Islamic State. They spent five years in that camp, um, and under the supervision of the Americans, they planned, plotted, and organized uh, the future state. How, what they would do, when they would be set free, because they knew that they would be set free. And in fact, they did. In 2010, the Americans uh, went back home. That was the promise of President Obama. And all the camps um, that the Americans run were closed. So the Iraqis did not want to run those camps. So, so everybody was set free, including, uh, of course, the leadership uh, of the future Islamic State. Now, of course, in 2005, uh, the situation in Iraq, in Iraq was very different from the situation in 2010. In 2005, there was strong support for the jihadists. In 2010, there wasn't. There had been the surge, 
so when the American increased the number of troops in 2007, uh, which had completely almost destroyed the jihadist movement, but also there had been the Sunni awakening. So the American had convinced the tribal leader of the Sunni Triangle to turn their backs to the jihadists in exchange for a democratic structure of the, the country. So democracy was what they used in order to convince them to give up arms and support. And of course, this democracy was never delivered because the Alawi government had repressed the Sunni population. So in 2010, this group uh, composed by very few people had no money, they had no support, uh, it was on the verge of extinction, and that is when they thought perhaps we should cross over to Syria. Because in the meantime, the Arab Spring in Syria was quickly turning into a civil war, but above all, in a civil war which was funded uh, by various uh, Arab uh, countries from the Gulf. It was turning into a proxy war, and that's what they did. They crossed over, and they attracted a lot of money, because these were professional. These were you know, people coming from Saddam Hussein <laughs> regime. So they had fought uh, um, seven years uh, of war against Iran. Uh, they also had fought in the insurgency, so they were very good fighters. So very quickly, they managed to attract most of the money, but also to establish themselves as the most important group. So everybody wanted to join them. Um, and instead of fighting against Assad regime, they fought against the other jihadist groups in order to consolidate their position. But also, they targeted strategic regions, rich in uh, resources, natural resources, and this is not only oil, it's also water and rich arable land. All of this they had, planning, uh, pl they, they had planned and plotted uh, in five years in Camp Buka, and it worked very well. So by 2013, they didn't need the money of the sponsor anymore. They had carved enclaves large enough uh, to generate enough money to fight, but also to carry on uh, a sort of um, social works uh, inside the region that they control. Now, that is very important because uh, unlike Al-Qaeda or unlike also the Taliban, the Islamic State is an organization which understands the importance of nation building. They do not want to oppress people. They want to earn people's approval through, of course, the imposition of their own vision of the state. So their strategy has been the following. They will send uh, um, <coughs> dead squads inside the towns before attacking and conquering these towns, um, militarily speaking. This dead squad will get rid completely of all the opposition. Um, and that's the technique that Saddam Hussein had used. Then they would send the jihadists to conquer from whichever group was in control the town. But immediately after, they would retreat the fighters and they would send bureaucratic and administrative stuff, so no military stuff. They would then run the city. So these people would fix the schools, they would fix the roads, they would fix electricity, they would all the infrastructure, they even vaccinating the kids against polio. So in other words, people would not have the feeling to have been conquered. On the contrary, people would have the feeling to have been liberated. But the most clever idea has been to hand over the local population those strategic resources that they have conquered. So instead of uh, doing as the PLO, for example, to maintain a sort of total control over these resources, a sort of um, communist or socialist uh, kind of economy, they adopted a very capitalist economy. So they handed over the resources uh, to the tribal leader. The tribal leader then would run uh, these resources a bit like a, a little corporation 
and this Islamic State levied taxation on their profits. So when you read in the newspaper that the Islamic State is smuggling uh, oil to Turkey, it's not the Islamic State per se. It is the people living uh, in that region uh, who have been handed over the task. So local population, civilians, who have been handed over the task to do the smuggling. And in exchange for this, they pay taxes. So there's no difference in the way the Islamic State finances are structured from you know, the way our country's finances are structured. Now, that was very, very clever because, you know, that earned them the consensus of the population. And I would add that this was, is very clever because that also gives you the idea of what a nation is. So a modern state, the modern nation state uh, <coughs> has two fundamental tasks. One is to protect you um, inside the border, so law and order. And the other one is to protect you from outside uh, attacks, which is national security. But these two tasks uh, are performed by two different forces. So the police uh, is in charge of law and order. The army is in charge of national security. That's exactly the same distinction that you find in the Islamic State. Now, no other armed organization had showed this sensitivity to the importance uh, of what a true nation is. So, um, I'm going to talk out of five minutes about this concept. Uh, and then we can start the question. But I want to add something else. Uh, we all have seen the importance of propaganda. And the Islamic State has been the best, I would say, in using social media and propaganda. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best because it's the best. It's also the first armed organization that could use this kind of propaganda because we didn't have social media in 2001 or in the 1990s. So it is possible that in the future we'll see more, this mo I mean, we'll see this model of using the social media being used over and over. But there are certain elements um, that I think show the sensitivity of the Islamic State to certain kind of issues linked to the nation building. Now, let's not forget that the Muslim uh, political utopia has been in the back of Muslim uh, for centuries and centuries. From the fall of the caliphate uh, until today, the Muslim have tried time and time again to express themselves politically. And radical Salafism, to a certain extent, is the product of that attempt. Because initially, Salafism was um, a movement of admiration for the European nation state. I mean, the Muslim look at us and said, my gosh, you know, they have created the nation state. Why can't we do the same thing? So they tried to reach out to Europe in order to basically emulate what we had done. And uh, the answer was colonization. So this is why uh, Salafis then turn into an anti-Western movement. But originally, the message was uh, we would like to be a nation, exactly like you. So the Islamic State seems very, very good at seducing young people, especially young people, using this kind of message. Come, join us, become a founding father of the new nation. Become a founding mother of the new nation. Come and procreate in order to populate this nation. Now, that is for a lot of these young uh, people who are lost in between two worlds, you know, grow up in the West uh, with uh, Muslim parents, um, most of them, you know, coming from faraway countries, so immigrants, um, they're in suspending between. They don't know if they're Western or if you're, they're not. So all of a sudden, the Islamic State comes and says, uh, you need an identity? I'll give you the identity. I need you. You are fundamental for us. It's extremely, extremely seductive. So 
there is one video in particular that I think uh, it clearly shows the fact that the Islamic State does not want to be only a nation. It also wants to be an ideology, which is a new way of building nation. And this is the video that was produced the day before the declaration of the caliphate. There is a, a jihadist that knocks down, you must have seen it because you know, all the TV showed it, that knocks down uh, the border between Syria and Iraq, uh, um, saying that's it. That border built in um, 1916 by the French and the British doesn't exist anymore. Now we have created our own nation. But that jihadism is not a European and is not an Arab, it's a Chilean. It was purposely chosen because what does Chile bring to your mind? The most brutal coup of you know, the Cold War. That Chilean represents the anti-imperialist message that the Islamic State has launched to all of those people. This is not only one nation. This is also your nation. It, this is also the deliverance that you will get from centuries and centuries uh, of oppression. And it's very, very clever. So this is just one little example, but there are many others uh, showing the um, attention to details, uh, the attention also to the psychology of you know, the person that is on the other side, uh, how to recruit. And again, you know, we almost go back uh, to what I told you at the beginning. Uh, they do not recruit people just because they're people. They target people. They couldn't recruit me. They knew I was going to be a bad terrorist. But my friend... Uh, she was a good one. And then she fell into that trap. So um, to conclude, um, I would say that uh, we should not undervalue the enemy because this is an enemy. Let's not be fooled about. But at the same time, there are many ways to defeat an enemy. For sure, if this enemy is so clever, for sure if this enemy is addressing a need, an important need of an entire, I would say almost you know, race of the Muslim world, bombing is never gonna work out. We did not defeat the red brigades because we locked them inside high security prisons. We defeated the red brigades the day in which that wall the Berlin Wall came down. The Cold War was over. There was no any more reason to fight. Their ideology had collapsed with the collapse of, of that wall. And that's why they declared the end of the armed struggle. We did not defeat the IRA by killing everybody that was part of the IRA. On the contrary, we defeated the IRA through negotiation, through a peaceful process through a reconciliation process between you know, two peoples. Uh, on one side, uh, of course, you know, the Irish, and on the other side, you know, the British colonizer who had moved to Ireland three centuries ago, four centuries ago. There is no way that this bombing campaign is going to bring a solution. On the contrary, as I told you before, this bombing campaign is having tremendously negative consequences on this continent and is risking to tear us apart. And that's something we must understand. Now, I'm not saying that we are doomed, but what I'm saying is, as I did in 1978 when I discovered that I shared my life with a terrorist uh, from one moment to the next, uh, it is, let's start understanding what has happened, why all of this took place, why my friend became a terrorist, why are we where we are. Thank you.